Hello, welcome to the Q Pod episode 81. I'm Jumper at Dave Vellante. Dave, salute again as always. Hello, Hello. from Austin, Johnny. <laughs> Guess where I am? Oh, buddy, amazing. You live in New York now? No, practically feel like it. Um, this has been an awesome week for news and action. You're at the Dell Analyst Tech Deep Dive. I'm here in New York City doing a lot of research on the startups, how they're getting access to GPU, what's innovation look like. I talked to a foreign trillion dollar fund manager, sovereign global sovereign fund, now running a private practice. We talked about the U.S. sovereign fund, the Trump election. I mean, it is absolutely incredible to see the reaction to the election um, and the impact on the tech industry um, and just all, the overall um, landslide victory by Trump and the signals of certainty or at least some certainty to the country. Um, it's been really amazing because, you know, it's just been what a um, interesting election. The election has impacted us. And of course, you know, we've been talking about Lena Khan, and I don't think she's going to have a future in this market. And we're going to get into all that and, and, and more um, M&A, funding, private equity, stock Dow is hitting an all time high. They had a relief rally two days in a row. I talked with the Einstein of Wall Street yesterday. I'll publish it today. He was on our, our studio for media day yesterday, post-election commentary. Um, all, we had top cloud executives in as well, startups talking about the how Amazon, Microsoft are hitting all-time 10-year highs, continuing to thunder away. And, and we're going to do a deep dive on this episode with Amazon Web Services and Amazon as an overall whole. Andy Jassy, Matt Garman, uh, you're going to unpack that. You've got some great data to share. So if you're watching this episode, it's going to be action-packed. Um, I got to catch a plane. You got meetings with the top Dell executives. This AI thing is changing how they're going to do business. And again, we'll start to see the curtain raise up from this toxic culture in the United States to now a much more innovative view and just post-election commentary from the CEOs all, you know, congratulations, Donald Trump. I mean, you got Bezos, you got Jesse, you got Michael Dell, everyone's weighing in, trying to put this behind us. And even Kamala Harris' speech was like, can we just get the normal government? So, yeah, so much to unpack. Um Really, the top story is the election. Um, I kind of predicted the landslide, uh, and I saw that coming. Um, I didn't think it was going to be absolute um, crushing blow outside of the blue states, but you know, Kamala didn't pick up any gain on any Biden numbers from the previous election. So, you know, this is absolutely referendum by the country, in my opinion, to tell the Democrats and the Republicans just get a certainty. Let's get through this. Let's get some peace. We care more about. Our, our lives than we do about all these other, these, these multiple causes. The New York Times had a great post yesterday in the op-ed really kind of calling out. This wasn't about Donald Trump. This was about the country and people's movement. So yeah, it really is, Dave, you know, we've been talking about it. We don't really get into politics on the pod, but you know, we have been talking about the innovation economy and it felt stuck. So this election has multiple points. It's so much to unpack. The tech angle is huge because the role of X in this was huge, right? So, like, Elon Musk went all in. Um, and, of course, he's got an ROI at his buyout from Twitter <laughs> with a nice Starlink contract, uh, SpaceX contract, Tesla stock booming. The very interesting dynamics. Yeah. I mean, I you got it right. I got it wrong. Uh, I thought it was going to be a lot closer. Uh, I guess I would say, obviously, there's a sugar high right now on Wall Street, although things are finally calming down today. You know, Bitcoin's still rocking. And so that that says that there's some real positive sentiment in the in the capital markets. I would say the one thing I would caution folks is, and people have been talking about this, is the 10-year yields have been creeping up a little bit. And the reason is that people are worried about the debt, as rightly they should be. You know, we're talking about a trillion dollars a year uh, just to service the debt. And there's about 10 trillion that has to get refinanced at higher rates. Uh, I heard Jay Powell this morning say, no, I wouldn't, <laughs> the president can't fire me. It's against the law. The law doesn't support that. So that's, you know, some already is a little bit of friction between the Fed and, and the executive branch, which I, I think there should be friction. Good. It should be, you know, separate Fed. You know, but look, I mean, I think to your point about Lena Khan, I think we're unquestionably going to see a lot less circumspect in terms of um, uh, regulation and, and M&A. I think that will loosen up yeah. you know, quite a bit. 
Uh, having said that, you know, it's not like the Trump administration, the first Trump administration, you know, let every M&A go through. I think they will be, you know, somewhat, you know, more careful than they had been in the past. But I think there's going to be a, a, a big M&A boom, you know, post the Trump era. And it's going to be really interesting to see what ha happens to the S&P 500 a year after the inauguration. You know, some people think it's going to go down. Others, I heard a really sharp analyst this morning said he thinks it's going to be, you know, well up uh, into the 6,000s. And so, you know, look, we got to move forward. Uh, the sun came up in Austin, and I'm sure it did around the rest of the country. So time to move forward. Well, I mean, I'm here in New York. I'm right behind in the Wall Street here for all week. And I'll tell you right now, the conversations here inside the building and around the traders is, is that the Dow is adding more names to it than they've ever done before. They usually would never add a name. They got, you know, they, they added um, NVIDIA. They took out Intel. Sherwin-Williams is in there, other companies. You start to see growth and these companies start to go out. And the commentary around the election is really about unlocking and just saying, hey, Trump, and we got we just want some stability. And it's really about what's known and unknown. And Trump's still a wild card, but they want some certainty. And I think they got that with the election and his clear mandate. But the thing that comes out from some of the on the capital market side, both the executives running companies and, and advising these growth companies, IPOs and M and A. So the, the private equity market has been kind of thaw, thawed out. I mean, they've done some deals, but they've been just the demand from what I'm hearing is so high to do deals, not only take over trouble companies and maybe take them public, but also get in on these later rounds, right? So you start to see the private equity totally getting ready to lock in on deploying capital. For those rounds and also maybe some turnarounds and some roll-ups okay on that side and then the ipo pipeline people are optimistic here and saying this should be a boom for ipos and so that's another factor so will the companies finally go public i think you and i talked about this a bunch of pods ago where you know the election was going to hold the ipos up and that's truly the case now there's a fever of let's go let's get down in business so the market is reacting the relief rally up today some stuff's down but not by much but you're going to see that tell sign. So the question is, what will fuel that growth? Can the AI wave and all the CapEx spending, combined with the money being put to work, really kind of create an, this innovation wave, which some are saying is that post hype of generative AI is still kind of like it kind of fell into a little lull and that we're ready for a kick up. Obviously, we're following the CapEx spend. That's going to be an enabler. So that's going to be a big, big discussion. So what will fuel this growth? And will that market be open? The demand is high. The capital is waiting to put to work. So the vibe here is very positive. So two things I want to talk about. One other thing I, I, I wanted to touch on, uh, given the new administration, is the CHIPS Act. And so you know, the CHIPS Act was basically passed in the middle of a, a situation where we couldn't, you know, autos were backlogged and you couldn't get semiconductors, you know, basic semiconductors for automobiles. And, now, was, you know, there's a glut of, of automobile class semiconductors, but, but Pat Gelsing did a remarkable job of rallying the government and the right people. He pushed all the right buttons, both here and in the EU, to get some, you know, capital from the taxpayers, you know, $50 billion. It hasn't, certainly hasn't all been allocated, but there's a lot of talk now in Washington about maybe folks want to rethink that. Maybe they picked the wrong horse. Uh, maybe they're spreading their, their bets too thin. Uh, you know how I've felt about this, John. I, I, I've always said that I felt that, you know, the CHIPS Act, $50 billion is a drop in the bucket. My feeling has always been that Apple and Amazon and Meta and Google and, 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 and you know, some, maybe some others um, yeah. should be carving off some money out of their balance sheet. Those with big stakes in this, Apple clearly has a huge stake in having um, alternative production for semiconductors outside of Taiwan, ideally in the United States, but potentially, you know, elsewhere. And I think they should, um, in my view, the government and Intel and those companies and maybe some others should get together and basically take over Intel's foundry. I think that is a potential viable option. You know, maybe there's some private equity play there, maybe, maybe not. But I think that would do a couple of things. One, I think it would be, um, um, it would take the albatross of foundry off of Intel's neck and it would give Intel designers, you know, an opportunity to really shine because I think they would really do well. And I think the second thing is you'd have real skin in the game from the government and from these leading U.S. manufacturers um, and tech companies who have tons of cash on the balance sheet. 
And I think they've all got a stake in having onshore production. So that's sort of one thing that we're watching very closely. The other thing, to your point about growth, I think it's, it's, it's the most important point in my view. And I will say this, there have been, since World War II, there have been two sustained decade long, if you look at the five-year average of productivity growth, there have been two sustained above average decade long, roughly decade long productivity growth booms. One in the 60s when the consumer boom hit and the productivity came from manufacturers to meet demand drove efficiency, you know, as consumers started yeah. spending. The second one was in the 1990s in the PC era where it was very, you know, personal productivity driven. The, the, the former was very command and control centralized. The latter was very individual, as you, you and I recall, personal productivity. The AI boom is probably going to be a combination of both. There are going to be central command and control. We're going to drive productivity and AI throughout our organization. In addition, there is going to be, let's call it citizen AI, where individuals learn how to deploy agents, how to deploy bots, and how to automate their workflow. And they are closer to the action where things need to be automated. So I think it's a double whammy combination of centralized command and control efficiency and individual personal productivity, like the 60s and 90s productivity booms coming together. And that is the promise of AI, which to me is vital to get growth back up, GDP back up to 3% or above and drive that productivity because that's the only way we're going to get out of this debt mess, unless unless somebody wants to attack Social Security and Medicare, yeah. and, and, and but which politicians don't want to do. So I think your point about growth is absolutely the most important point of this yeah. next decade. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've been seeing and, and talking about here and, and got Palo Alto is there's a systemic um, change afoot. So, you know, you mentioned those growth windows you talked about, totally relevant. And I think absolutely is going to happen here. This this secular trend of Gen AI will have that productivity gain, just like the PC revolution did. You're going to see it differently, and those agent, agentic systems will come online. The question is when, and that's a hype cycle issue. Hold another, put a pin in that. The issue around productivity will happen, and when it does, is the current system in shape? You mentioned a few structural details. The role of data, centralized versus distributed. You see data lakes today and technology changing with distributed computing. There will have to be a reset on architecture. We've been covering that on the cube, cube research, like it's nobody's business. So if you're interested in this topic, go check out the research. Now, why I tie it to the election, Dave, is because Trump and a lot of other people isn't just pulling a rabbit out of the hat or shooting from the hip. There has been conversations over the past decade around things like a, a global U.S. sovereign F investment fund. Bitcoin has been a big discussion for Trump around, you know, putting in a Bitcoin reserve. You talked about the CHIP Act. I guarantee that's going to probably be doubled down on. So what Trump and these policies, put the, the personality of Trump aside, whether you like him or hate him and all the bombastic things he does, his policies that people voted for, people want them. Hey, if the is okay, that's just there. But he's very much a let's compete. I'll give an example. I talked to um, an interview yesterday, Winston Ma, who will be up, up tonight or on Monday. He ran a global um, um, sovereign fund, and he was telling me that if you look at Singapore, China, and other these other countries in the Middle East, there are trillions of dollars of investment. The U.S. has got nothing, right? So there is real momentum to say, and Trump would probably get behind this. This is the way he thinks. This is the kind of systematic change from a global competitiveness standpoint. Do we stack up a sovereign fund in the U.S.? Do we blue a Bitcoin reserve? Do we double down on the chip act? Do we bring that manufacturing, get TSMC up and running in Arizona? Things of that nature. So all of these things in combination, Dave, have to be laid down. So the, the, the question that I'm looking at now is, to your point, to get that growth, you got to have a structural change, both on private and public partnerships. So, you know, we've been seeing that in the public sector with cloud computing. But I think that's why Andy Jassy, Jeff Bezos, Sundar Pakai, um, even uh, Tim Cook were all congratulations to Trump because there is a huge problem with China, a huge problem with some of the competitiveness because they're structured differently than us. So I think the U.S. is what we'll probably look at and the capital markets would probably fall in line to look at new alternative corporate structures to compete. So, again, this is some of the conversations that I'm digging out here in the New York area because, you know, they're much more finance focused than, say, Silicon Valley. But, you know, think about it. The U.S. had a three trillion dollar sovereign growth fund. Okay, that's 
that would be everyone would go crazy. Yeah. Okay. Invest in infrastructure. Invest in more chip uh, chip building. You're talking about a lot of capital that could be deployed in the U.S. for U.S. citizens, so they can compete with AI. I, I, I circle the, the AI competitiveness conversation is on top of it. Do we want to be competitive with our export of AI versus not being competitive? So again, one, all of this is happening. One thing I would just question is whether or not that if the government is going to double down on the Chips Act, I would much rather see private enterprises, uh, like I said, those. You know, the big, maybe it's not all the MAG-7, uh, but certainly NVIDIA would be in there. And Well, I mean, the government, the government piece is a good question. This is what you and I talk about all the time. Hey, participate, but get out of the way, right? Wall Street has worked like that. And since that's history, they look at the politics and they don't, I mean, a lot of, a lot of re more Republicans here than in, say, California, where I live, but they don't really weave politics. They just want certainty. Give us what you got and let's, we'll, we'll figure it out. The Fed doing some interest rates drop. So they just want a little bit of certainty. They don't want anxiety and 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 wild card. So so putting Trump aside. So you, you get that. The Wall Street people just say to the government, get out of our way. Just make your decision and we'll figure it out with the market. So the market forces always have driven Wall Street, NYSE behind. I think that has to happen to your point about Chips Act. Hey, throw some capital at it, but just get out of the way. Right? Well, you know, don't, don't <laughs> mandate things and, and, and get in there all these requirements. I, I would like to see. Okay, we got fifty billion allocated. Let's let's fine. Let's allocate that. But I would like to see private enterprises basically take over Intel Foundry, um, and have some uh, some kind of consortium. I don't know. I have to think through how exactly that would work. But I, I just want to separate it from Intel Design, give them an opportunity to really shine, give each of them, and then then put forth a capital structure that that has you know much more patient capital. Not that I mean, look, I've said it before. The only way that Intel Foundry wins here and survives is it's got to have wafer scale. And the only way it gets wafer scale against TSM is it's got to bomb price. It's either has to bomb prices or it has to have virtually infinite capital. And the only way the latter is going to happen is if those companies who have skin in the game, yeah. and, it, and I, I just, I'm shocked that nobody's really proposed this and the government hasn't put more pressure on them. And I feel as though the government should go to the Apples and the Googles and the Microsofts and Amazons and say, look, We'll back off a little bit on breaking you apart and, you know, we'll get our foot off your neck. But you've got to step up for the good of the country and the good of your business to help fund onshore manufacturing. It's critical. Yeah. And but yeah. nobody's really proposed that. And, you know, it's not like it's not like Google's raising its hand and saying, hey, we'd love to spend some some of our balance sheet cash. But they should. I mean, I would much I think that's in some cases a better and long term investment than even buying back shares. Anyway, well, I don't. I I want to get into some of the growth things, but just one final point on the election. I don't really like the way in the politics. That's not my wheelhouse. But I will say this: common sense was the big thing in this election. But the other issue is how do we govern and how do we put policies in place to enable our best asset, which is people and the AI wave, which is going to be a major export. So if productivity is going to happen, which you pointed out, I agree. Then how are we in the U.S. going to compete globally? So I think. The focus of structure around how that innovation strategy gets deployed will be key. Now, that's why the AWS and Amazon and Apple are big because they're huge. Look at Tesla. I mean, Elon Musk, some say he just did this to get the, the Tesla chairs, but he's highly motivated with Tesla. He's highly motivated with SpaceX. He's highly motivated with Starlink. I mean, I'm sure he'll get some contracts out of it. Does, is it going to be inside dealing? Well, Oversight will manage that. So he's an entrepreneur. He's creating value. There are many other entrepreneurs out there who are going to do the value, and that's going to be the key. And the power behind this growth engine is going to be what do the hyperscalers do, and how does that ecosystem develop? Because you look at the cloud computing players, and even throw Oracle in there too, because they're a database. They're going to be a big part of generative AI. AWS, Azure, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Oracle. How are they going to deploy their compute and all that CapEx that they're spending to power and create this entrepreneurial, you know, Cambrian explosion thing. And and so Wall Street's always trying to squint through AWS's numbers and go, well, they're, you know, they you know, we kind of joked about the analysts and said, you need 25% growth. Well, here people are still saying, is it too high? It's, it, it's a 10 year high every time. Amazon is doing great, right? So is others, NVIDIA. What is going on in that stock day? This is where the power is gonna come in. Of course, you got on-premise and you got edge, you know, the hyperscalers play a critical economic role in this future. And 
breaking them apart, they've got to be looked at differently. I mean, breaking them apart is not the answer. The answer is what are they enabling? And so to me, you know, that's the big million dollar question. What, how are they doing? Are they growing? Because if they grow, then the ecosystem around it grows. So I'd like to get your take on this. I know you have data and you're digging into this. Well, let's, let's, say let's this. get into so, some, of, some of this power engine of the that these clouds are providing is enablement. So let me um, let me start with what I'm, I'm here in Austin at Dell. It's the three day Kool Aid injection from from Dell. It's their uh, their tech summit, Dell Tech Summit. It's all analysts. It's probably I don't know 50, 60 top analysts here. Michael Dell, Jeff Clark, all the presidents of the divisions. I mean, it's they do a really really good job. What I'm hearing from Dell, it's an NDA session, so there's not much. There's not I can't. There's a lot of things I can't talk about. But we had private meetings with with Michael, with Jeff, with, with the whole management team. What they're laying out is a very cogent, first of all, Dell is smoking hot. I mean, Dell's stock in March of 2023 was at 37. It's today, it's at like 135. I mean, it's up 3.6X. At one point, it was up 4X, more than 4X. So Dell is back. I mean, as an infrastructure leader, AI infrastructure leader, I got a tour of their AI lab. This is the, this is the lab that Elon went to, okay, and to... To, to check out whether or not that, that these guys could deliver on you know, their promises. And so, you know, I can't say too much about that, but it was with Ehab, it was Ehab's lab. And um, it was really, really impressive what they're doing. Now, the reason I bring this up is they're laying out a very cogent, two vectors. One vector is the big five LLM players who are consuming a lot of AI tech, a lot of infrastructure. That's OpenAI, it's Google, it's Anthropic, it's Meta, it's XAI. They wouldn't tell us who they're selling to, but they're selling to maybe all, but some big chunk of those uh, those companies, perhaps through the cloud guys, to, to your point. The interesting, and, and so that's one vector. The other vector is enterprise AI, what we called last week, George Gilbert and I coined the term enterprise AGI. And here's where it gets interesting, John, is those five companies are spending money like crazy. The cost of Gemini Ultra to build that was about $190 million to train Gemini Ultra. Now it had a big context window, so it was probably more than it cost to train Llama 3. But nonetheless, the costs are going up and the prices are coming down. The cost per token has come down for GPT 3.5 came down four orders of magnitude in four years. And GPT 4 is coming down two orders of magnitude in 24 months. So costs are going up. Prices are coming down, so it's a bloodbath. Add in the fact that Meta and XAI are open source companies that are basically giving this stuff away. So the cost of doing this and the business models are really questionable. What's going to happen there? Nonetheless, that's a big market, and that's where all the innovation is coming from. On the enterprise side, I spent a lot of time with Cohere, really interesting company. They're not chasing the holy grail of AGI. What they're doing is they're working with companies like Dell, they're also powering Oracle's agents. Ed Cohere is going hard after what we're calling enterprise AGI. By enterprise AGI, John, we mean that agents do work better and more accurately and more productively than humans in the enterprise. That's what we're calling enterprise AGI. So you've got these two vectors now that I think are very clear opportunities. I think the former, the the got the LLM companies chasing you know the big holy grail of AGI. Who knows how that's going to end up? A lot of people think it's going to commoditize, but there's a lot of money going into it. But the real boom for companies is going to be in that enterprise AI. And that's something that I think has people really excited. Yeah, I mean, enterprise AI, from my research on my side, I see that as well. Um, IBM put out a study from McKinsey Day. You saw that 1% there. This huge market with enterprise AI. The post that you and George Gilbert put up on SiliconANGLE and the few research was awesome around the enterprise AI, AGI thing, which is, which is nice to say that because it gets attention. And also throwing in the Sam Altman and Jamie Diamond gets some attention too. But the premise that the, that every company like JP Morgan Chase and JP Morgan, they have data that is so valuable and they don't even know what to do with it yet. So a lot of people are in this enterprise. I don't know what I don't know. And they're applying their AI to figure out the AI, right? So so we're in a in that early stage moment where it's really not even first in. It's like, okay, this AI factory is going to be a power architecture for us to get the value extraction. 
but they don't even know what they don't know. So you're seeing the first wave of it. So I think you guys are right on this because when the enterprise starts to figure out how do I fund their CapEx for that, I think they're going to go to the cloud. And I was talking to some folks here doing my research around the GPU consumption. I thought the three companies in New York, they're all saying they can't get GPUs. If you're a startup and you don't have a Series A, you have nothing, right? Maybe you could scrounge up a GPU, um, but for the most part, they're constrained, right? You can't get them. So I think there's a play here for the cloud guys and super smart to just build it and they will come because there is no place to go. NVIDIA has five customers, okay? You kind of pointed out, you look at the CapEx spending, the numbers, you threw this up on the last uh, uh, pod, okay? They're off the charts. That's NVIDIA. NVIDIA is doing it. Now, Amazon probably going to try to figure out a way to saying, let's get our chips. Now, there was a rumor, we, we posted a story on Silicon Angle yesterday that there's a rumor that AWS wants to get incentives out there for, to get, get off NVIDIA. And that's an, around Anthropic. So you start to see Anthropic become more aligned with AWS. They're throwing out an, another couple of billion dollars of investment, whether that's going to be cloud cost coverage or infrastructure investment. Anthropic's got a CapEx problem. They're running on all the cloud. So I think if I'm Amazon, I take Anthropic on the team, right? You got it. I mean, Anthropic is a major piece of the puzzle. And that's what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they are basically kind of subsuming so, in. And so the smart play by AWS, I'll see Matt Garman so, next week. I'm going to ask him that question. But think think about how this plays out. <clears throat> OpenAI basically controlled by Microsoft, and right? Microsoft's money. Google, obviously, that's their captive market. Anthropic now aligning with Amazon, and you're absolutely right. I could see, and they hinted to this in the first big uh, Anthropic investment. They basically want Anthropic to exclusively use in Inferentia and Tranium. Anthropic's not going to necessarily want to do that. You've got to train on NVIDIA. I mean, I, I, we'll see how that all plays out. And then you got Meta and XAI, you know, building their own platforms. The, the point is, OpenAI, Microsoft, that cloud is going to have its AI stack. Google's going to have its AI, you know, stack. Anthropic and Amazon, their AI stack. And those clouds are going to go. If Amazon, if AWS is a hundred plus billion dollar business, now it's like, okay, let's take that to 300 billion. And that they're going to be inside those walls. The real interesting opportunity here, and Alex, if you could go to slide six, is, and this is where I really like, you know, what Cohere was talking about. So what, what this slide is showing you is the, the, you know, we love power laws. This is the long tail here, John. So on the left side is package apps. You think, think human capital management, think HR, think supply chain management um, and, and the like, all these package apps. But that's really only a small part of the processes. And then we build some custom apps to do, you know, maybe some of our own internal stuff and our own supply chain. That's cool too. But the vast majority of workflows are unautomated. It's all human-based, and this is where Agentic comes in. Now, it's going to take years for all the pieces of Agentic to come together, but that long tail, that eight, where it shows here AI agents, and, and what, what, what we called here problem uh, novelty, this is actually um, a, a slide adapted from, uh, I think it was A16Z, but that's the big opportunity for Agentic AI to automate all those unautomated processes and and. Here's the point. Thank you, Alex. Here's the point of this, John. And I talked to Jeff Clark about this extensively. Those big five LLM vendors, they are never going to get Dell's supply chain data. They're never going to get JP Morgan's 150 petabytes of data. And that data is the real gold. That's where these companies are going to drive competitive advantage versus being trained on the internet. Yeah. And that, I mean, you got to get, they, they get trained somewhere in the the question is going to be the CapEx to do that. And this is where I think the, a, the I talked to someone who used to work at J.P. Morgan and, and ran their billions of dollars budget. He now runs the venture firm, John Lear. He runs Workbench. He's an investment now, but he invests in the enterprise. It's the data center game, Dave. Where are they going to get the cash? They're going to have to use either a managed service or build their own. So that's where I think Dell will have a great opportunity. And the question is, what they have to run that in concert with cloud because if Meta, Amazon, all the big five are buying all the GPUs, you're going to start to see um, uh, the barriers to entry be scale, right? So they're basically buying out all the GPUs right now in the hope that it could be productive on the other side. You know, for the people who say that money's not going to have an ROI because they're trying to get recoup the dollars, I look at it the other way and saying they're going to enable more productivity and over time we'll get that back. So if, you're, if there's no alternative computing platform in the enterprise, 
to the CapEx in the cloud right now with GPUs, then the cloud guys win. If there's an alternative architecture that can lower the price point to deliver that CapEx-like value without spending it, then you have a whole nother paradigm. That would change the game and the enterprise AI will shoot through the roof. So in, in my analysis, I, I, I blew up the Dell meeting because I want to be here in New York, but Dave, I mean, you know, I would have told Dell, look, at you got, that's your opportunity. Okay, because you can write your software stack to work in concert with the cloud on GPU services and then use your hardware and your AI factories in the enterprise. So if you're JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon with all that valuable data, what's this cost to get, get that training and that interest and reinforced learning and then powering all those agents? That's the question. Yeah, that's on the table. So the answer would be, he's got to spend billions of dollars to get a data center up and running to train his own stuff because he's not going to want to put it in the open, you're gonna have to go to cloud, you're gonna build some stuff. So that's to my that's the way the AI factory is a distributed computing opportunity. I, I, I think they're gonna use a, it's gonna be a hybrid. They're gonna have they have data in the cloud, they're gonna they're gonna use the the cloud resources. They're also gonna bring data on prem. They're gonna use, you know, Dell or HPE, you know, servers. We'll see what happens to Supermicro. The Supermicro is not enterprise, but but certainly Dell and HPE are and and Lenovo. They're gonna bring those servers on prem. And because that's where the data is. So it's going to be a hybrid AI. And I want to, Kim, I, I, I don't know if it's time, but I'd love to address the Amazon letter, uh, the the letter, open letter to the board that Blue Duck Capital put out. Did you see yeah. that? Yeah, that, let's get into it. Because okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so let's, Blue Duck let's Capital. Debunk, let's debunk that. Debunk. So Blue Duck Capital, this, this Manhattan Beach, you know, company, you know, investor, and Alex, if you bring up the slide one, they put out an open letter to shareholders um, and and Amazon's board. And what we're showing here is the sort of results of that letter. Um, so this was a, the, the money chart that they had. They said, look, Amazon, you're not performing. Since Jassy took over, Amazon's only returning 7% uh, re return on its stock price. Look at Google. Uh, look at the, you know, these other QQQs and Vesco QQQ, look at Microsoft Meta, Walmart, Costco, they're kicking ass. And then these are the, this was the basic, these, these five bullet points uh, were their formula. Here's what you should do, you know, board, give us cash. That was really, and I put it in red because that's really what this is about. The other stuff they're already doing, improve efficiency, give us better guidance on AI, lean into the health kick with Whole Foods. And firm up the studio business and the content business. These these last four, of course, Jesse's already doing that. This is what it's about. It's about the first one. We want some of your balance sheet. Give it to us, okay? And and Amazon's been very careful to do that. Now go to the next slide, Alex, because this is why this is this slide is just that 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 premise is just crap. If you look at the 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 the, the second piece here, okay, here's a stock uh, price, a five year stock price of of Amazon. You see, Jassy becomes CEO early July. Okay, yeah. right at the peak. So Bezos stepped down right at the peak. Then what happened? So Fed Chair yeah. Powell gets reinstated in I think November. So he didn't he didn't act. He, he probably would have acted sooner if he got reinstated sooner if he got nominated or uh, approved. So ZERP ends. What happens next? Fed starts to tighten. What happened to IT spending? We exited uh, 2021. IT spending was expected to grow at seven and a half percent. It ended up being down, know, like two, two and a half, three percent. So IT spending tanks. What did Amazon do? They said we're going to go all in on cloud optimization. You remember that? Even though it's yeah. going to hurt us, we're going to we're going to stay loyal to customers. We're going to show them how to save money because we don't want to lose them. So what happens? The stock tanks, right? Because the the big engine of of, of profit, Amazon Web Services, wasn't growing as fast. Okay, what's happened since then? You'll look at that. Now, if you yeah. if you go to the next chart, Alex, here's a- Hold one. on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go back one. I want to just take- right, Go back um, one, Alex. Go to that- Go back one. Go back one. Go back. First of all, this is great analysis. I, I would just add, if you look at where cloud optimization is right there at the top of the, the chart, that you see that that it goes right down, is like a knife edge, and then kind of zigzags up and then goes up to another peak right under the O, cloud optimization. Okay. Yep. Think, think about Amazon, right? First of all, Andy Jaffe doesn't really give a shit. He did Jeff Bezos about what people think about their losing money, making money. They're a long game player. They're, they're focused on the customer, okay? What happened there, you want to add another bullet, is pre-buys happened, Dave. So 
So what Amazon did at that time, cloud optimization, is they did, and if you look at their quarter-on-quarter -quarter earnings growth, it's still up, right? So they're winning. So this is a complete, this blue duck, whatever they're called, completely are just, have no clue about how they're working. They just want cash. I like, I agree with you. But if you look at the cloud optimization, it makes total sense. All the free buying happens. Now, I have on my source, sources, that's, that's really what happened. There's been no public statement about it. So that's new information, but just know that that happened. They have marketplace. They have all these awesome, efficient systems for customers. They, they, it goes up and then drops. Why? Because that next, that results change. Then they keep the customers. Now at that time, they did not have the Gen AI cash flow coming in. So they keep their base and up and to the right. Again, look at, if you draw that line, it's this, that's a nice slope. And from what Jackie said in the last earnings, it's up. So Amazon is crushing it right now. On well, AWS specifically. So, it, it, I mean, like, like, like well, both. who are these people? Who are these people? Well, both. You remember what happened? Uh, thank you, Alex. Remember what happened during, um, you know, we came out of COVID. Remember Amazon retail, you know, started to, they had, remember they had hired so many people during COVID. So they had to cut back and it just took a while for it to take, take effect. But so Amazon retail was, was not doing well. Amazon web services was slowing down because of cloud optimization. Jassy took action and now they're back. So Alex, go to slide three. This is what I want to show you. This is where Blue Duck is, you know, quacking like. You know, I would call them. I would call them lame duck. Capital. Lame duck, lame duck capital. So look at this one year chart, okay? And and it's a plot of Amazon, Alphabet, uh, the the SBDR, Invesco QQQ. That's the SPY on the previous chart. Uh, the spider, Invesco QQQ, which is a tech heavy um, Invesco uh, fund. And then Microsoft, Amazon's outperforming all of them in the last year, almost 50% growth to Alphabet's 37%, uh, the SPY about 36%, you know, Invesco, QQQ, and then you see Microsoft at, at you know, 17%. Only Meta on that chart, that previous chart, forget Costco and Walmart, I didn't even plot those, but Meta's up 85%, but Amazon's outperforming all the others. So thank you, Alex. The point is that that, that letter was all about one thing. We want you Green. to give us cash. <laughs> right. Now, so here's the Green. thing. Here's the question. Well, the thing is that those moves work in private equity when you have lame leadership. And I've seen this before where the, you have the, you know, the, the, the focus of trying to get you know, some sort of hostile kind of posture. Amazon's discipline is just too good. Jassy's, he's, he wasn't born yesterday. He's, their company is disciplined. They're back to work. They, he's going to overcome that. Jassy's probably approval rating right now internally might not be that high. There might be some disgruntled stuff going on because he's made some bold moves. The, the pre-buying, which I pointed out on cloud optimization, the, the absolute focus on Gen AI and their performance is showing. You saw the growth and the numbers are there. And they don't really care about the cash as much for the, that customer, Duck uh, Capital. They care about their customers. So you know, if you have lane management, this is where the, that, the hostile posture might scare people and make boards do weird things. But I don't think it's going to shake Amazon. And it's on just too disciplined. Yeah, but so here's the thing. So let's say we're 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 on the Amazon board. We're having a conversation. Okay, we got all this cash now. They do have enough cash that if they wanted to, they're in a position that they could do stock buybacks. They could do dividends. They could give back to shareholders, like most companies, by the way. Or they could yeah. say, Are we better off investing in R and D? Are we better off buying GPUs? Are we better off investing in AI and Gen AI? Or is it a better investment, better use of our cash to buy back stock and give back to the shareholders? Or do we want to do some hybrid, some balance? It depends on whether or not you believe this AI wave is bigger than anything. And so if you're Jassy, you're probably sitting there saying, look, I'm doubling down on the future because it's going to deliver better long-term value to the shareholders. And I love that. I've always said that, you know, companies, if the companies have to buy back stock and they've got to give, give you know, dividends, give back stock, that, that they don't have enough ideas to invest in their in their future from an R&D and, yeah. and technical standpoint. So I love when a company says, you know, forget about placating Wall Street. We're going to invest in the future of our business. It's a ballsy move. But yeah, most I mean, they hedge their bets and they do a hybrid. I love the fact, if look, at if Jassy chooses to just double down on tech and investment, that is, I mean, I'll, I'll dude, applaud I like like I said, when Matt Garman was hired, I called him the wartime conciliary. Jassy's going to be at reInvent, I heard, whether he's in the front row like Jeff Bezos used to do or be a set piece of announcement 
We don't know. All I know is he's going to be there. He's not there to check up on Matt Garmin. He's there because he, Amazon is the power source for their growth. Their profitability is all times high. Their operating income was off the charts. I mean, they're just kicking ass. And to your point, you know, Warren Buffett recently made moves where he stopped buying his, his cash and changing his buyback posture. So I think, you know, this, there's maybe something that we don't see around the corner, whether it's Trump and, you know, taxes, earnings. I don't know what's going on there, but like I would keep the cash. They have to win the AI game, Dave. If they do not, they're they're going to be on a on a downward slope over time. They got to get the startups like they had in Gen One. They got to win the enterprise. They have to be the power source, like the electrical company, electricity, for the enterprise. And like you said, enterprise AI is such a big market; it will be massive. Okay, I think the consumer stuff is all good, but there's not going to be a lot of winners there. There's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to go into the enterprise and do agentic systems in verticals, in industries, build custom solutions. And the VCs are all investing on that thesis team. They're looking at the enterprise saying, hey, there's a lot of incumbents that will go away and new opportunities. So I think the whole consumer thing is is a hard one. But if you're a startup, you never know. You swing for the fences. If you, but, but better choice is to go in the enterprise. And there's demand. The demand will be there. And I think Amazon's smart. They got to win that. They absolutely have to win that. So... I want to share some other data if I can, because again, they got the big five uh, guys doing it. A Amazon supposedly is working on this this foundation model called Olympus. But Alex, if you bring up slide four, this is what the big five are doing, John. And and a lot of the folks in the audience know this, but some might not. So what this is, uh, it it actually shows the relationship between test loss, which is a measure of accuracy for these models and how test loss is affected by, by compute power, by data set size and parameters. Parameters are all the, you know, the weights and the biases, if you will. And what the data shows, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but you can read about it on the Cube Research. The bottom line is you can't get better on, with just improving compute and, and not scaling data set size and the number of parameters. You have to scale all three together. So the data tells us that performance improves smoothly as you scale up compute and data set size and parameters, but only if these three factors are scaled together. And so if you want to stay in the frontier, it's brutally competitive, it's expensive, and if you take the Jamie Dimon metaphor, Jamie Dyson, Dimon and, and Amazon don't have to participate in the competitive race. Rather, they benefit from it and they can apply that innovation both internally and externally, if you go to the next slide, Alex, this is what I was talking about before, you can see that the prices, the price, this is price per millions of tokens. The blue line is GPT 3.5. Look at it, it came down one, two, three, four orders of magnitude in four years. The white line is GPT 4.5, uh, uh, GPT uh, uh, 4. It's come down two, it's, it's on pace to come down two orders of magnitude in 24 months. Thank you, Alex. So the point is, as we made before, costs are going up, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these, these models and buy all the GPUs, prices are coming down. Why, if you're Amazon or even Apple, do you want to you play in that? Why not just get the benefit of it and partner up, lock in Anthropic? That is, to me, the right strategy. Yeah, I think, I, and I think the, um, the entrepreneurial activity around it, look at the hedge funds, and um, raising billions of dollars for, for going into AI, seeing a lot of bigger money coming in. I think the digital infrastructure game is happening big time. And Amazon will has to take advantage of that. So does Alger. The question is, with Anthropic um, at AWS optimized on their IaaS in terms of the service, um, that might be their bread and butter. That might be their power move. And I think we'll hear it reinvent shift um, and, and performance at the low end of the stack um, and because that's where they can beat Azure. And Azure's got OpenAI. Right now, OpenAI's got some good momentum. Uh, but it's still early days, Dave. Very early days. And All right, John. Hey, I got to go. I got to go. We're getting kicked out. <laughs> so I'm out. <laughs> Abbreviated coupon. Shay, Travis right, Jones, taking this out. Yeah, they're literally pulling the plug on you. All right, Dave. <laughs> good to see you guys. Uh, episode 81 in the books. CubeCon's next week. It's supercomputing coming up. We got reinvent. We've got big events going on in January next year. So a lot of action. Thanks for watching and listening.